So we would like to present a clinical case of severe aortic stenosis and severe mitral stenosis, and then to take you through the imaging planning steps. And this will uh, extend from the CT to finite element modeling, computational modeling, and also how the CT was used on CT fluorofusion on the GE Valve Assist 2 platform. Simon's then going to take you through the technical procedural steps and how this imaging was used in real time. And then we'll have a brief discussion as to the role of advanced imaging in structural heart valve disease. So the case uh, we're presenting is a 61 year old lady who had Hodgkin's lymphoma many years ago treated by mantle radiotherapy and a prior splenectomy. And in 2013, she was diagnosed with mixed aortic and mitral valve disease, uh, which progressed and uh, six years later, she presented with severe aortic stenosis and severe mitral annular calcification with mitral stenosis and an element of pulmonary hypertension. She'd been turned down for surgery in multiple centers um, and initially deemed unsuitable for transcatheter intervention. And she was even offered the commando procedure uh, as the only high risk option, which she was prepared to undertake. Um, and I think was planning on traveling to Canada. But then she was, uh, trans she was reviewed at St. Thomas's Hospital for a second opinion. So this was a quite a complicated case to plan for. And our normal steps in this type of a situation would be to review the echocardiogram to confirm the severity of the aortic valve and the mitral valve disease, and then to perform a multi-phase ECG-gated cardiac CT scan. We would analyze the CT scan for the standard TAVI measurements, but also do a sophisticated analysis to see whether or not the case was suitable for a valve in MAC procedure. After we've obtained some of the anatomical measurements, we would determine what size of valve we felt was most suitable and appropriate for this patient, that would minimize the risk of outflow tract obstruction and also a paravalvular regurgitation. Our next step would be to use finite element modeling, which is a technique uh, based on computer simulation, which is able to model the mitral valve annulus, the mitral valve leaflets, the cordy tendony, and also the papillary muscles. The advantage of this particular technique is that it's able to account for the various different tissue properties and to look for calcium deformation. Using the pre-specified 29mm Sapien 3 valve, we're able to virtually implant this onto the pre-procedural CT dataset at various different heights. On the top of your screen, you will see that we're shifting from position C to position B and thereafter to position A. And on the right of your screen, you will see the predicted neo-left ventricular outflow tract area. Once we've manipulated the CT dataset, we're able to guide the interventional cardiologist as to what the optimal deployment zone will be and what the likelihood of neo left ventricular outflow tract obstruction is also going to be. Our preference is also, therefore, to perform computational fluid dynamics. And this is a sophisticated technology that solves the Navier Stokes equations and incorporates the multi phase ECG dataset along with the echocardiographic parameters that are used for boundary conditions. On the left hand of your screen, you will see the pre procedural CT dataset and the pressure and flow vortices of blood flow in the left ventricle before a valve is implanted. On the right of your screen, we've virtually implanted the 29 millimeter Sapien 3 valve onto this mesh, and from this, we can derive the pressure, flow, and velocity within the neo-left ventricular outflow tract once a valve is deployed. In this particular case, we were able to demonstrate that there was unlikely to be any significant left ventricular outflow tract obstruction with a 29 millimeter Sapien 3 valve in the mitral annulus calcification position. The third step in our imaging planning will be to take the CT scan data set and to perform some segmentation and to draw planning lines on the GE Valve Assist 2 platform. This then enables the interventional cardiologist to have live CT guided fluorofusion to guide the procedure at the time of the implantation. We're now going to move through the procedure where Simon's going to take you through the actual steps. Yeah, thank you, Ronak. So it actually turned out to be quite a complicated procedure towards the, uh, you know, take it all into account. But to begin with, we started with a straightforward tabby. That was very easy and quick. And that was a 23 millimeter Sapien uh, 3 ultra valve you see being deployed there with the safari wire in the left ventricle. No aortic regurgitation uh, after deploying that at nominal volume. Um, and then we next moved to uh, treating the mitral valve. Here you see some blood speckle imaging uh, on the right hand side. And uh, in a minute when we get back to the fluoro, you'll see us moving on to treat the mitral valve. 
So I think you could probably see there the uh, intense calcification of the ACNA aorta. I mean, this really was a porcelain aorta. And also you can see the map quite clearly there on the right hand side. And here you see the image fusion with CT. Um, this helped to guide the position of the transeptal puncture, uh, which, as you know, is quite important when you're performing mitral valve procedures. But importantly, you can also see uh, the uh, orange and light blue circles, which indicate the optimal positioning of the 29 millimeter sapient free. So here we are just about to perform uh, the transeptal puncture. And I'm just exchanging the transeptal kit uh, in order to bring an agilis into the left atrium. We pointed the agilis down through the mitral valve, introduced a pigtail into the left ventricle, and then exchanging that for a safari wire. <coughs> and on the, um, the more proximal end of the distal end of the uh, safari wire, I put an extra bend to mimic that bend that you see there going around into the left ventricle. This is uh, uh, ballooning the septum in order to create a, a hole big enough to introduce the sapien valve. And I had a lot of difficulty getting the sapien valve around that bend into the, uh, towards the left ventricle. So I needed, I had to snare the wire in the left ventricle from the other leg and pull that wire through in order to create a rail to uh, bring the sapien in, in, uh, into the MAC. And that's what we're trying to do here. You'll see it, it will soon uh, point downwards through the MAC. So there it is in position. We've now turned on the image fusion. You can see that's a, a pretty good position of the valve. We're just checking with transesophageal echo. And I pushed the, um, safe, uh, sorry, the safari back into the left ventricle. And here we are doing a slow deployment using um, pacing at about 120 beats per minute just to try and minimize movement of the valve. And we've also suspended ventilation while we deploy the valve. During the valve deployment, you can see I'm now pushing the whole valve forward in order to make it coaxial uh, with the mitral annular calcification. And then on while following deployment, you can see the transophageal echo down at the bottom left. You will, you will see that again in a second. Um, and then it's just simply a matter of removing the device and uh, checking with both transophageal echo. And we also performed um, left ventriculography to show that there's no much regurgitation. There you see some lovely imaging. Do you want to say anything about that? Ryan? Yeah, I mean, the blood speckle imaging is a new technology and it's the equivalent of having 4D flow um, on echocardiography. And we can do this on our transesophageal echocardiograms to provide sophisticated uh, measurements. Now, interesting, you see there, that's a the filter from a Claret uh, device. And there was quite a lot in that filter from uh, the procedure that we performed. So it was well worth using cerebral protection. So Simon, we've used uh, CT fluorofusion, computational modeling, and also finite element modeling on a number of cases now. Um, how do you see these influencing your current practice and how has it been a benefit to you in the past? I think, well, there's no doubt it's made a big, big difference to the safety of these procedures. Um, to be honest, aortic valve procedures generally are very straightforward. We don't really need to use it for that. We have tried. It's probably not added an enormous amount, but with mitral valve procedures, it's a completely different ball game. Um, even the valve in valves and valve in ring, but particularly MAC, I don't think you can safely perform a, a procedure with mitral annular calcification without this technology. And, and do you think it's applicable to centres which don't have a lot of experience to help train and educate, or is it also a value to highly experienced operators like yourself who are very used and familiar to looking at fluoroscopic images and guiding your procedures? I find it invaluable. I mean, when we first started doing mitral annular procedures, mitral, mitral annular calcification procedures without this technology, it really was very hit and miss. Um, and it, it's changed completely. The other thing that we haven't mentioned is we also did a 3D print, hmm. and that helped Absolutely. a lot to actually visualize it prior to the procedure. I mean, I think here at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital, we have a, a very similar philosophy that we think we should be incorporating all of the advanced imaging modalities that we currently have available and that are also emerging into the future. And this extends from CT valve fluorofusion using the Valve Assist 2 platform, but also computational modeling and finite element modeling. 
Um, and I think our philosophy is also to make sure that the imaging and all of the imaging planning that we do before the procedure is made available for our interventional cardiologist, peri-procedural. Um, and so we, we very much like uh, using fusion imaging to be able to provide the imaging and the planning directly for the interventional cardiologist as they're performing their procedure. And the next step undoubtedly will be merging the fluoro with the echocardiography and the CT at the same time to provide the maximum amount of information that we can to improve patient outcomes.